Today on Call for Two, a spoiler-free review of the two English language cases in the Hidden Games Crime Scenes series. What makes these two games some of the best in the genre? Stay tuned to find out. So we're back with another mystery, suspects, cold case, document dump game review. As always, I will keep this spoiler free and I'll try to be deliberately vague, but I'll give you my overall recommendations. I will be showing you some components very briefly, but nothing you wouldn't see the moment you open the box. Now, I've got lots of videos on the channel covering these kinds of games, both spoiler-free reviews and full long seven-hour playthroughs. So if you're interested in this kind of game, um, you might consider subscribing to the channel and checking out those videos. So first things first, let's talk about what genre this is. What, what is this game? I've called these mystery suspect games. You can see here they're labeled sometimes murder mystery games. You might think of these as cold case games or document dump games. The general format is quite similar across these and there are dozens and dozens of these. They're all over Amazon, some cheap ones and some high quality ones. Essentially, you're presented with a dossier, a big uh, folder of loose documents that aren't in any specific order. There may be things like newspaper clippings, police reports, interview transcripts, fingerprint reports, receipts, uh, business cards, pamphlets, etc., maps. And they're basically set up as if you're come you're the, maybe a PI op reopening a cold case so you've got sort of the police file and generally there are a set of suspects let's say 7 8 9 suspects they all have some motive some alibi some opportunity and your job is to figure out which suspect really did it and you'll do that by eliminating some suspects because of their alibis and finding reasons why motives based on clues you uncover. The documents are essentially the game. There are no turns, there are no actions. You just go through all of the documents. There might be a couple dozen documents. And some of these games have uh, an online component. You'll either be checking out fake websites related to places in the game or sometimes fake accounts on real social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. Um, there's no replayability once you play this and a game might take you anywhere between two to six, seven hours. The, these games listed are listed at something like one and a half to two and a half hours. I tend to play them two or three times, take two or three times as long because we're sort of methodical, but depending on your speed and your group, you might go faster. There's no randomness. Um, you simply figure out the end of the story and if you solve it, you get the correct answer. Some games, if you get the answer wrong, you still read the solution. Some of these types of games, you can't proceed until you figure it out. So they're not replayable, but generally they're non-destructive. You can write on some of them, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. So you could pass it along and sell it. And maybe the last thing to say is these games do all involve a story, the story of the case, but they're not really about um, heavy narrative element. It's not like you're reading a super high quality novel. Okay, a warning um, before I give you my opinion about this series. 
these games are, the appreciation of these games is very subjective. And that's because um, they involve so figuring things out and calibrating the difficulty level of these cases is very difficult. So depending on your experience, your comfort with this kind of game, you might find one game too hard, one game too easy, and it's very hard to predict that before you start playing. These games are also very much benefit from coming in with low expectations. The higher you're expecting, the, the more amazing a time you're expecting to have, the harder it is to ever reach that bar. Um, they also require quite a bit of sort of experience playing this type of game to sort of understand the unspoken rules of what would be a fair clue, what kind of story, motive, and alibi is in the realm of possibility. You're sort of playing with some, some, uh, some license to make some things slightly cartoonish and not real world believable. And so... As you play these games, you come to understand those rules of the game a little better. And it's easy to come into this, especially if you're new to this genre, and sort of get fixated. Even if you're an expert, your mind gets fixated on certain ideas, concepts, possibilities. And so for any given game, if you get on the same wavelength as the authors, then you might have a great time. But if you somehow get on a different wavelength, either you rule out something that the author intended for you to understand or you interpret it slightly differently, then you end up banging your head against the wall for the entire series of the game. So again, very subjective. Don't take my word for these things. I think for most of these games, you would benefit. You're going to get the most out of it not only if you have low expectations, but if you sort of enjoy watching the sausage get made of how these kinds of games get made, that's the best uh, attitude to come into these games with. So before I go in depth on these games, let me give you the punchline for these two games from Hidden Games, these two crime scene series games. Um, these are some of the best games in the genre. They are lovingly produced. They're of the highest quality. They're probably second only to the series of four games by the Adventure Company in their Detective Stories series, another German company. You can see my playthroughs and reviews of that series. The Adventure series is uh, harder for more experienced players um, and that that's just the very very top tier stuff but this is just a tiny bit below that and quite far above almost everything else that exists um they're easier so they may be perfect they're probably perfect for sort of moderate players with some experience they're maybe a little challenging to total beginners and they may be a little easy for real advanced players of this genre, but I think such players will still have quite a bit of fun because the games are so clever and so well done. There are some really delightful multimedia elements, use of the internet, use of mobile phone stuff, and that's going to make it a special experience for people who are not used to that element in these games. If you've been buying these sort of cheap, mass-produced Amazon.com mystery suspect games, this is a different level of game with some very fun stuff. And those bells and whistles will make for a special experience if you're new to this kind of thing. I would say start with case one, the New Haven case in America and then move to case two, uh, the Midnight Crown. Um, and these have different names depending on what country you're in, but they're essentially the same game. So there's my punchline. It's a great series, and I couldn't recommend it more highly, especially if you're sort of new or have some medium level of experience with this genre. And now we'll go into the 
more deep analysis of the set. A little bit of background into this Hidden Games company. Um, Hidden Games is a German company. For some reason, the Germans produce some of the best games in this genre. So I've got two of the cases in front of me. Uh, the New, New Haven case, this is the American version. They've localized it into a dozen languages. In each language, they're customized for that country. So the names of places and stuff have changed. So the New Haven case is case one. The Midnight Crown is case two. Those are the only two games so far in this series, Hidden Games Crime Scene series, that have been localized for America. But there are four more games in this series. And we're told that cases three and four are in the process of being localized or will for sure be localized into American versions. Five and six, we're not sure about. Um, they do make other games, this company, Hidden Games, and it looks like it's a bit of a collective. These games don't have individual authors listed for them, which is a little unusual, but they're made by a team. And um, all of my experience with the company has been really good. Uh, one of the representatives joined us for one of our long life playthroughs and talked about the game a bit, little bit and we had a lot of fun talking with uh, her, with Francis. So I can't uh, speak more highly of this company and uh, this production. Very impressive. Okay, let's talk about what to expect in the box. And I say box lightly because you can see these are actually packaged in little flat pack envelopes, which you see for some of the games in this genre and is the probably the smart way to go. There's no need for a big box with silly props in it. Um, these I would call medium difficulty cases. Both of them are similar level of difficulty and it's very hard to give these things difficulty levels, but I think if you put adventure at the top of the difficult level, and then this would be medium, and then a lot of the ones on Amazon, I would call on the easy side. The game lists one and a half to two hour playtime. I like to double or triple those times, but it's, a, it's about on the order of some of these other games, maybe a little longer because it's a little more detailed. Um, the quality of the documents, remember the whole, the game is the documents, are quite good, quite high, and I thought we'd look at them briefly. So let's take a look. Here's a first little mind map of the suspects in the game, which I've already unpacked. And remember, everything I'm showing you is exactly what you would see the moment you open the box. So, I mean, I wouldn't study this too much. I'm going to talk about this mind map of suspects later. But you can see the game starts with telling you what four questions you're going to have to answer, pointing you to the website, telling you the contents of the game. There's a little introductory letter to get you started. And then the documents start, and we'll just walk through them a little bit so you can see. Um, all of the games include this standard chart that you could use to keep notes on and then a little chart for you to keep track of dates and times and alibis. That's slightly new to this genre. A newspaper on newspaper stock, quite common for this kind of game. Then a whole bunch of little miscellaneous things, photos, letters, uh, Envelope with contents in it, business card, little brochure, more documents, all color, all nice stock, police reports, emails, fingerprints, more charts, more stuff. So just to give you some idea of the kinds of documents you're going to find in this game. Okay, so those will all be available to you the instant you open the box, not in any particular order. Um, there's also 
uh, internet component of this game. There'll be websites that you go on that you might see referred to in some document, and there are fake websites that are created for the game. And you might find yourself going on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or something like that, reading a fake account of someone, something we also saw in the adventure series. The documents are overall quite high quality, but not as good as the best of them. There are some elements that I'll talk about in the end that are slightly lacking in the documents. There's issue of, it, uh, sometimes it looks like they're using uh, computer fonts for handwriting instead of a handwriting letter. So there's a little bit stuff like that. None of the silly props that you've seen in some of the standalone hunt -a killer games where you get this big giant heavy bottle opener that ser or a hat that serves no purpose other than to increase the cost, make it have to go in a big box and feel slightly immersive. There are two unique elements, uh, documents in, all, in both of the hidden uh, games, crime scene games. One is this mind map that I'm gonna spend some time talking about in the conclusion. And then the other one was that timeline thing. Uh, both games are very similar in sort of the quantity and type of documents. One thing that's a little unusual is that most of these uh, mystery suspect cold case games make heavy use of interview transcripts but for all the suspects. In fact, a good chunk of these games in this genre are almost entirely built of interviews with transcripts with the suspects and you trying to find sort of contradictions in there. And it's sort of nice that this one doesn't lean so heavily on that. I will say also that the internet component, in addition to having a whole bunch of clues that you can get, uh, hints you can get if you get lost, and having the end game question also has some audio files and some extra little stuff. So it's quite a high quality production and fun to be able to listen to. There's some full voice acting stuff going on, etc. You don't, I should say, for people who aren't familiar with this genre, unlike something like Detective Modern Crime Board Game, you never go and search on your own. You don't go and say, oh, this thing was mentioned, let me just go to Google and search for information on it. You don't ever need to do that. You go to the specific websites that are mentioned in specific places. Um, okay, as far as the quality of the writing, it's good, but not perfect. It does help to be aware that this wasn't natively written in English, so it's German and translated, and there are some little hiccups of translation, minor, but it helps to know that going in. When you get to the end of the case, and remember there's no time limit, you decide when you're at the end. When you get to the end, you should be fairly certain of the answers to all of the questions. Some of the games in this genre require you to take a leap of logic and you'll never really be sure. Some you're just 100% sure at the end. This one you'll be fairly certain. Um, if you've seen everything, you should know the solution to the case. The game, when you go to answer the solution, the game has got four questions and only the last one is actually posed as a multiple choice that you can get wrong. The other three you just click when you think you know it and it tells you the answer. And we'll talk about in the end whether that could be improved. And then the last most important question you answer is who did it? And that's a multiple choice. And if you get that wrong, it'll tell you why you got it wrong. Um, and then at the end, it will give you a full solution to everything. So you will read how everything unfolded, but maybe not, you, you aren't walked through all the evidence. So there may be pieces of the thing that you missed that won't be explained to you. And then there's a nice audio epilogue that sort of wraps up the case and gives you some emotional conclusion, which is quite nice. As far as the audience for this game, 
I do think that all skill levels of detectives will enjoy this. It is skewed towards uh, moderate beginners, I, I'd say. I think the beginners are may struggle a little bit to understand everything and st they'll struggle to find everything. I think the real beginners will not find all of the connections, but there's enough redundancy. There's enough repeated ways to come to the same conclusions that you will be able to solve it if you, if you work at it. The medium skill level players probably will have a fairly easy time, a reasonable time and get the right answer. Uh, and then the experts will will be able to solve it and won't really have periods where they're hitting their head up against a wall. I think it'll be fairly smooth sailing for people who are really experienced with this genre, but that's not to say that you won't have a lot of fun and some good aha moments and stuff like that, and we'll talk about it a little at the end. Um, the boxes say it's age 14 or plus. I think that's fine. Almost everything is very family friendly, but there are a little bit of little risque elements that might give you a little bit of pause before playing with a very young group. Um, my opinion, these are best with one or two other players. You could absolutely play this online with someone uh, on Zoom or distant on the computer. Um, I think it's harder to play these games with the larger groups, but you could, if, that's, if you're already used to it, there's nothing stopping you here. In the remainder of the review, I'm just gonna list some positives, some pros for the game that I really liked. Then I'll talk a little bit about some places for improvement, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. So let's start with positives. The most important positive is that the mystery in both of these games is logical, it's consistent, it's solvable and it's satisfying to solve it. When you put together all the clues, it makes sense and it feels good. Um, and they're not trivial. Not everything is just, here's the person wasn't there during the scene of the crime, so we crossed them off. There are some nice little leaps of logic that you have to go through. There's subtle little clues. You might miss one, but you catch another, but it's satisfying. In some ways, the series almost feels like they're taking a tour of all the different elements that are available in this genre, a little bit of everything. There are some logic math puzzles, there's some decrypting, there's some handwriting analysis, there's some understanding of human psychology, there's timeline alibis that make people uh, eliminate people. There's a real requirement to some attention to detail. There's plenty of red herrings. There's false leads that make it look like someone is guilty, but they're, then later they're not, etc. It's sort of got everything, and it's all done very well. One of the real surprise fun parts of the game is this mind map of suspects, which I've not seen in any other game. And if you take a look at it, I don't want to dwell on it too much because you'll figure, you'll see it when you play the game. But basically you've got all your suspects laid out here. But what's novel about this, and I'm not sure who, how they came up with this or if it's been done in other games, you would sort of expect that what you would see here is each possible suspect with their name and photo. And then you can write, your, you can write notes in each of these places, which is nice. And if you didn't want to write notes, you can put a post-it. But it's actually a little more of a puzzle than that. Some of these items have their name. Some of them don't, don't tell you their name. And that's something you have to figure out during the course of the mystery. And then some of them have extra information on them that's useful, that may be useful to you when you're putting together clues and trying to figure things out. And that makes the actual use of this quite fun and innovative. Um, and then this idea is quite nice here. They basically give you in both the games a way to keep notes about the timeline. And this is something that if you play these games, you get used to having to do yourself. But this is nice that it's already structured for you. So as you encounter the case, you're gonna find out that certain things happen on certain days at certain times, and that might make, provide an alibi. 
and this just provides a place for you to keep notes. And the fact that this is, you know, you can you can make a scan of this and copy it if you don't want to write it to it, but this just gets rid of some of the grunt work, some of the work that's not fun but is required to play the game. And I think that's a common pattern in this game series is a focus on keeping things moving at a nice clip and being cognizant not to weigh you down with brute force work. We've seen in some of these mystery suspect games uh, a decryption puzzle or something that requires you to spend 15 minutes with a pen and paper adding numbers to decipher a message and it's not that it's requiring you to think and figure things out, it's that it's given you um, busy work to do. And this game is on the other side of that scale. This game is all about presenting information that if you can figure out how to use it, you will use it very smoothly and uh, in a fun way. So that's, you know, that's an achievement of this game and something to really appreciate. Okay, more positives. As I've said, uh, one of the real feelings we've got we got when we played this game was a feeling of constant sort of forward momentum developing the plot. There is a very nice pacing where you're uncovering information, whether you're uncovering it through documents that are clarifying what's going on or the use of this occasional internet element. You are putting the pieces of the puzzle together and it's gradually making more and more sense and funneling your suspect winnowing down your suspect list uh, narrower and narrower. And, you know, I think if, if we could choose to make it more difficult, it would be nice to hit, hit roadblocks where you just are lost. But the fact that this, this game is constantly giving you more stuff to play with, more clues, um, more developments, means that the entire time you're playing, you're fully engaged. Um, another element that I liked that's slightly different from other games in this genre, it's quite common in this genre to find a game where there are timeline alibis. So a murder happened at a specific time, and so you find that different people were at different locations during that crime. This person was home, so they couldn't have committed the crime. This person was seen here, so they couldn't commit the crime. Um, that happens here in this game, but these games both make use of a wider, a larger range of timeline, so that you have to, you're looking at things and saying, oh, this person found out about this five days before the murder, so that means they had this information at the time of the murder or this information wasn't known until after the murder, or this happened this day. So it's not just who wasn't there at the scene of the crime at a specific time, but it's a more complicated, interesting set of timelines of when knowledge was known. And that is an advancement over other games of this genre and a welcome one. Um, there are some subtle clues. I've talked about how there are some redundant clues. There's like several pieces of evidence that could lead you to a certain conclusion. And one of the things we look for when we play these games is when you figure something out, do you then look back and say, oh, that explains this weird thing we saw that we didn't understand at the time. Those little aha moments are very satisfying. In some senses, they're the most fun parts of this game when something that didn't make sense suddenly clicks into place later on. And these games do have that element and it is a pleasure. Okay. Um, more pros. When we played these games, so I've said a couple times that these are on the easier side, but in fairness to the game, in both of these games that we played, we were debating till near the end between a couple different suspects. You very quickly can eliminate certain people or they don't have good motives or whatever, but it's a, a, 
to the credit of the game that even at near the end, we're debate, we still have some hesitations about who the culprit is. It still feels like, oh, it could be this person, it could be that person. And that's what you want in this game. Now at the end, we were fair, all sort of unanimous, the three of us that played, and fairly confident. But the longer you can keep that doubt in the player's mind till the end that they're not, they think, but they're not quite sure, that's a good thing, and this has that. Um, I've talked about, here's some a few miscellaneous things. I've talked about um, the decision to pack this in a flat pack. I think that's the right one and avoid all the stupid, silly, physical props that serve no purpose, but to make it look like it's gonna be fancy or exciting. Um, all of the audio elements and multimedia, whether it's dealing with your cell phone or websites or listening to someone talk, are all available in transcript form. So if you're hearing impaired, you can still play the game and enjoy it. The, there are occasional math, crypto, sort of logic puzzles. They're all of a pretty, of a, they're enjoyable. They're not filled with busy work. They, they may require a little bit of math. Whether you're good at it or bad at it, you may struggle more or less, but they're all solvable. And again, there's a hint system if you do get stuck. None of them require busy work. I've already talked about my personal experience with the company, with Francis, the social media manager and the international games manager, being more involved. I have yet to meet um, someone who sit and, well, I guess that's not true. Some of the Sherlock Holmes games, we've had the authors come in and sit with us and talk with us while we played. But um, it's rare for this type of game. These games tend to be sort of mass mass produced without very much involvement for the company and I've been impressed with with the Hidden Games company. Um, one of the, the, so the last thing I'll say, and this is going to segue to one of the cons or one of the areas for improvement, but one of the things I noticed is that there were periods where we sort of intuited who the culprit was but didn't have all the evidence to absolutely prove that it wasn't someone else or prove that it was that person until the end. And there's some, I think there's, there's a way to look at that as a positive. I mean, that is a positive that it took us to the end. The only part where I think we're starting to get into the negatives is that the game just asks you to guess and you could just guess and get it right. It's in fact, your intuition may very well give you the right answer even before you can prove it. And I think maybe that leads us to talking about some of the weaknesses or areas for improvement for the game. So the first sort of broad class of areas of improvement has to do with the difficulty level. For me, for my group, this is a little on the easy side. Not easy. There are a lot there are a lot of games that a lot of this genre that are much easier than this and easier in a way that's not fun. This is not easy easy, but it's on the easier side for my comfort level. And I'd say especially with the first game with the New Haven case one of the ways that it was easier, easy, relatively easy, is that you see a clue, you make some sense of it, and then it's overdetermined two more times. In other words, two more places, the game makes sure you understand that this clue means what it says. So it would be like you might imagine you see a fingerprint on something and you say, oh, I bet that belongs to this person. And then a page later, their friend tells you it belongs to them. And then a page later, a newspaper article tells you it belongs to them. You're kind of like, well, I figured it out here. I didn't need you to hit me over the head with the fact that, it's, that this is what it means. And there are a bunch of places in these games that that happens. 
And that's sort of a signal that it's calibrated to be easier. It's calibrated to hold the hand of people who might have missed the more subtle versions of the clues. And I think ideally you'd like to figure out a way to design a game that didn't redundantly over-determine some of these clues. It's not easy to do because if you get that balance wrong, then it's too hard. And part of the solution to that is just that you make some games that are super hard and some games that are super easy. But you could try to get clever and not give the same information multiple times, but just provide information that if the players got it, maybe they could answer a different question or know a little bit about something else so that if they see all the clues, they get a, a better, more filled out picture of what happened. But if they miss some, they still understand most of it, but they miss some little side details rather than sit three times presenting the same information to make sure you don't miss it. Um, again, dealing with difficulty level, I do think it would be nice if the company tried to communicate in some way the difficulty level of these games. Uh, there are only two so far in the English series, and I would rate them about the same level of difficulty. And, I mean, there's no standard for difficulty level for these games, and people are not going to agree. So it's impossible to ask for sort of an objective difficulty level. But you could certainly rate them in terms of their relative difficulty. So if Hidden Games wants to produce some cases that are harder than others, it would be nice if they started putting difficulty levels, a scale from one to five or whatever, on games. And we've seen that on some of the games in this genre. Um, that would be nice. Another place, another room, place where there's room for improvement, I think, has to do with the end game answering questions. So in the worst of this genre, some of these really bad ver kinds of these games, you, when you're ready to solve it, you go to the end, it's got a single question, who did it? And you just say, I know the answer, you click, and then you get the story. And some of them even just have an envelope you open which tells you the answer, the story of the case, and who did it. This is much better than that. There is an online hint system, and there are four questions which are nice. Now, the first three questions, though, aren't really questions that you get tested on. It just says, like, do you know who did, do you know why this person was killed or whatever? And when you click it, it tells you. And hopefully you got that right. I think there's room for improvement there. I think those could be multiple choices where you get it wrong, it would tell you so that it wouldn't spoil it if you got it wrong. And I do want to point out, so the final question is a multiple choice, and if you get it wrong, it tells you why it's wrong and you get to try again. So I like that. I like, you shouldn't tell the person the answer if they get it wrong, let them go back and try to figure it out and make another guess. But I do think it's worth pointing out that what one company did with this, which I thought was really brilliant, is that when they asked you that final question, each question, it wasn't just one question, but each question, but let's just take the final question, like who did it? You would answer who did it, and then it would say, which two pieces of evidence prove that they did it? Or which two pieces of evidence in a different question exonerate this person? And in the beginning of all of these uh, boxes, all of these games, it gives you a list of evidence that's contained inside. And the way this game did it is each piece of evidence had a, a letter. So like A was the police report about the murder, B was the autopsy report, C was the fingerprint thing. So when you answer these questions online and you said what proves they did it, you'd have to say, well, piece of evidence D and piece of evidence G. And then the game might say, no, that's not right. And the reason that's so clever is that when you play this game, you may very quickly 
say midway in, think, come to the right conclusion about who did it. Your intuition and the number of clues and sort of a metagaming of how these games are done might really tell you, okay, I know it's this person. There's been so much story around them and I figured out a little bit, I know it's this person. So it's quite easy to get that right almost by accident or without figuring everything out. But then having to say what documents proved it requires a much higher level of skill. And I think that offers the opportunity of the best of both worlds because it gives you, it means the case can be sort of understandable by someone that's not as skilled, but then when they get to that part, they may not be able to tell you exactly why they're so sure this person didn't do it or couldn't have done it. And that's okay, I think, because you've got a hint system. So if they get up there and they're like, I've been through everything, I understand it, um, let me test myself. Then if they don't know how to answer that or answer it wrong, they can go back. If they're wrong, the website will say no, go back. And they could spend some more time trying to really pinpoint what really rules that person out? What really implicates this person? And if they really get stuck, they can show the hints. And that's a way for experts to really be challenged because finding all the little subtle pieces of evidence that definitively exonerate or prove someone is much harder than sort of solving the case in general. So I think there's a place that you can for free widen the range of difficulty levels of people that would enjoy the game. Okay, a couple more areas that I think could use some improvement or might be worth exploring if you were designing this kind of game and if hidden games wanna, wanna think about exploring different elements. One thing that we experienced when we played the second case let me back up. One of the challenges with this genre and part of the puzzle of this genre is you get this document dump that's not in order. You get reports from months, a year ago, and yesterday, a day, day after the incident, day before the incident. They're all just randomly presented to you as a stack. Now, part of that is on purpose because part of the puzzle then is looking through all these documents and making sense of, oh, I see this one came from this time, this one came from this time, and they don't, wanna, they don't want to give them to you all organized so you know these all go together, these all are about this suspect, Max, and these all are about Louise. They want to make you work for that, which is all fine and well, but, there is a high price to be paid for that. And that price is that you start seeing documents that make no, it's not that they make no sense, it's that they seem out of, t they seem to be giving you information you shouldn't have. In other words, you get information about a suspect and let's say his fingerprints and you're like, a person is fingerprints, you're like, I've never met this person. I've never heard about them. I don't know why I'm looking at their fingerprints. Like all of a sudden, I've got Gerald's fingerprints. Well, I don't even know who Gerald is or how he gets involved in the case. And what's sort of disturbing about that, what feels off about that is that in a police investigation, first you would, uh, you would come into contact with the suspects or the people at the scene of the crime or who knew the victim. And then the police officer would, might request their criminal history. So like in a police investigation, it would proceed in a certain order and it, that would make sense. And what brought all of this in perspective for us is that, for as players, is that I've been playing these document games, these murder mystery games for a while. And then we went back and played the precursor to all these from the 1930s. And the precursor for these games were books called crime dossier books. And they were framed as sort of police report, but in a bound book. 
and they had very realistic documents, just like these do, police reports, interview transcripts, but they're bound in an order, and they're sort of interspersed with commentary from the police investigator. So when you open the book, the first thing you read is, you know, there was a call to the police about this incident. And then you turn the page and you see the detective sketching out the scene of the crime. And then on the next page, you see he's starting to interview the people that were there. And then as you go on, you see he's requested criminal reports, criminal records of some of these people. And the ability to control that linear progression of documents, the value of that in terms of immersing you in a story, in an unfolding emotional narrative that feels more like a novel and is much more compelling and immersive and believable, the, that's the value you get out of being able to stage the order. And you really don't lose much. So my suggestion to the whole genre of these people making these document dump games is to really consider the value of possibly going back to a bound system or an ordered set of documents that can be, that can form a, a sort of thread, a story. And I think that would address some of the issues we had with this game. One was we were encountering people and information about people that made no, seemed, seemed way premature. We had no foundational information for it, so it felt jarring. But the other thing that's slightly more subtle is sort of emotional attachment to these people. I think part of that would be solved by more of a narrative unfolding of the evidence. But part of it has to do with the writing of the game and the story. And I think this one, even more than some of the other lesser games in this genre, um, wasn't that interested in giving us an emotional connection um, to the characters. And I don't, I'm not sure we ever felt really involved with the characters' lives or cared that much about them. Uh, a little bit, a little bit in each case. There were moments where we sort of related to them, but we weren't sort of drawn into their lives. Um, okay, here's a suggestion or an or a area of improvement that's more subtle and hard, hard for an author to get right. But there were areas in this game where we sort of use some meta gaming, meta reasoning to, to rule out people and rule in people. And what I mean by that is if you play enough of these games, one of the things that's going through your mind is trying to figure out when things are red herrings. And you get a little bit of feel like, would the designer go through this much trouble for a red herring? Would the design, so in sort of, if you wanted to sort of guess who the culprit is without understanding anything, you might use as a little heuristic, pick the person who's talked about the most. Pick the person who I have the most documents referring to them. That's a little heuristic because it's natural that the game is gonna be focused around the real culprit. And so it's hard to avoid that as a designer and it has to do with how much work are you willing to do to sort of throw detectives off the scent of the trail. And I think adventure is one of the best at that. Adventure sort of convinced us early on that they were willing to go through a lot of effort to throw us off the scent of the trail. Most of the games aren't. And I think maybe you could do a little bit better here in terms of throwing us off the trail by giving us more of a focus on someone else's little sideline before we figure out it's not relevant. And lastly, in my topic of room for improvement for story pacing and motion, etc., I would say that when I, on all of these games, there's a little bit of suspension of disbelief when it comes to sort of cartoonish elements of the crime. 
So like, would this person really, like, would this fight really lead them to kill this person? Are they really going to kill this person to cover up a certain thing? Most of the time in real life, the answer is no, right? It's only very rarely that someone would be really pushed to commit a murder or whatever, or cover it up. But you sort of suspend disbelief. You say, well, the story is going to be a little bit cartoonish about people going to these extreme measures. But I think on the scale of things, we felt that these games were a little heavy on having cartoonish motives. I think in both cases, we felt like we knew the answer, but we felt like, uh, is there, are they, would that really be the reason they would do that? Would that be enough of a motive for this? And the game might say yes, and we would say in real life, no. So I think that's a very hard thing to get right in these games, and I'm not saying it should. these games should be perfectly realistic, but maybe a little bit tweaking that knob a tiny bit. Um, okay, uh, I think this is my last, last section on areas for improvement, little tiny ones. I do have some concern for the longevity of these games because they rely so heavily on some technology elements. It's not just websites, but it's depending on fake social media, existing real social media site accounts. There's some technology with cell phone stuff, and I worry that at some point that's going to stop working. Now, should you really worry about that? As long as it's up when you buy it, I'm not sure why you should care. So just don't buy it and hold on to it for 10 years and expect to play it. Now, to their credit, the company has put most of the stuff or all of the stuff alternatively online on their website as hints. So if the phone stopped working, you could click and hear what it would say. But I would say that um, if I was the company, and especially since I know how hard they've worked to localize this, every time they move it to another con country, they have to worry about cell phone calls in that country and all that kinds of stuff. They've already done a lot of, bit, a lot of work in creating sort of a virtual police area that you can log into, whatever. And my suggestion would be, um, that as fun as it is to have these uh, high-tech things where you could get a call or you make a call to someone, etc. If you virtualized all that on a website, so if instead of letting people use their real phones, they logged on and they said, I want to make a virtual phone call using your company website, and that simulated a phone call or simulated receiving a call, or if you had your own area of your website that was for fake a fake browser, so you could go to www.fakefacebook.com. It's not as cool as finding an account on the real Facebook or on the real Instagram or the real Twitter, but I think it's a small it's a small issue, and if it means the difference between making more of these games or localizing these games or not, I'd be all in favor. I think it's. It's in the same category of whether you include a bottle opener in the game. It's a minor thing that can be cool and cute, but is not essential. And I would say the same thing about localizing these games for different locations. Like, it's very cool that the company went to the trouble to when they localized this in England and France and America, they changed the location so each country gets its the case is New Haven case in America and a different town in each of the other countries. And then the newspapers localized for the different towns in the different countries. Um, I think that's overkill. It's wonderful. It's great, but it's not necessary. And I don't think anything would be detracted if the story was set in Germany for every country. That's not going to stop. That's not going to affect whether I want to play it. Um, okay, more minor little nits. Um, one of the things I look for in all of these games, and I you find in the very best of the games, is 
some humor, some subtle humor and moments of humor. And I don't think that was really present in either of these games. I don't think either of these games really had any humor. And I think that gets back to the sort of storytelling um, and when you have a real writer who's used to writing real compelling narrative stories as opposed to just mysteries and facts. And I think, you know, that would be nice. A little bit more of a narrative thread, a little bit more of humor and side discussions and that kind of thing would kick it up to another notch of quality. Um, there were some translation hiccups, no showstoppers, everything worked fairly smoothly, but just a little bit of stuff. And that's fine. In fact, in some ways, that adds a little mystery element to the game because you read something and it doesn't sound quite right. And you always ask yourself, was that a translation error or is it something I'm not understanding, etc. Um, lastly, in terms of improving quality of stuff, one of the parts, one of the interesting things in this genre of game and in the 1930s crime dossiers and in Sherlock Holmes is occasionally you'll get documents with handwriting. And you're frequently looking and saying, do I recognize that handwriting? Can I tell anything by this handwriting? And, um, some of the games, it's a very tough balancing act to get that right. Sometimes the handwriting is very hard to read and it's very frustrating. Here it felt like, I, I believe, that most of the handwriting was a handwriting font for the computer and computer typeset. And that meant it was trivial to compare, compare handwriting on different documents. And I think this fits with the difficulty they were aiming for, but it took a little bit of a, away from the experience. And if you compare that to something like this, the very top tier of these games, like adventure series, those ad adventure games, when there's a handwritten note, first of all, it looks like it's, it doesn't just look like it's a photocopy of handwriting, it's handwritten but it looks like you look at that thing and you're like, this is ink on this paper. Did someone hand, actually handwrite this thing? I mean, it's believably handwritten and it, it's natural that it would be written differently if the same person wrote it. It's not a font. You want to take the game to the next level? That's, a, that's one place to do it. Okay, final thoughts. Uh, the Hidden Games Crime Scene Series, at least these first two that I've played, don't quite dethrone the sort of king of the mountain of the adventure series. That remains the high, the high bar for this genre. But this series is just below it and sits alone in that tier just below it. They are very high quality, very well done, very cool, with some very cool multimedia features, uh, the audio and the phone, or whatever. And I think those features, when you combine with the quality of the mystery and the quality of the total experience, make these the perfect starting point for a group interested in this genre. I would very easily recommend Case 1 and Case 2, played in that order, to someone who's curious about this genre. Hard to see being disappointed with that. It is a real accomplishment. It's clearly done with love and care, and the company clearly cares about what they're doing and cares about producing a high-quality product. It is impressive. I can't wait to play more cases in this series. And my only hope is that we get some harder and longer cases. If you do play um, one of these games, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And you might be interested in watching the playthroughs afterwards. There's full playthroughs of both games on the channel. and. It might be curious to see how you encountered it differently, where we got stuck, where you got stuck, and whether we came to the same conclusions. And I'll see you next time. Bye.